if someone else needs help, you are the person that they would call on. You don't need to call on anyone. You are the help, if you get what I mean. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 458. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Professor David Meyer. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick. And I love the martial arts. I love traditional martial arts. been training pretty much my whole life. And so now, found a way to turn that into a career. And that's what Whistlekick is. We're doing all kinds of great stuff for you, the traditional martial artist. And you can check out everything we're doing at whistlekick.com. One of the things you're going to find over there is our store. We make a bunch of stuff. We make uniforms and apparel and protective equipment and just tons of stuff and new stuff all the time. And if you make a purchase, of course, you support the show, but you can also use the code PODCAST15. That's going to save you 15%. And it lets us know that this podcast leads to sales, which helps justify the expense of this podcast. And because I feel like using the word podcast a couple more times, if you want the podcast website, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There you will find every single episode we've ever done. We do the show twice a week, all for free, and it's all in an effort to connect, educate, inspire traditional martial artists from around the world. My guest today tells some amazing stories, wonderful stories, and talks about some people that you've heard of, people who've been on the show, people who we've only talked about on the show. These stories, these conversations that we have today are awesome. I had a great time with Professor Meyer, and I hope you enjoy listening to our chat. Professor Meyer, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. And you can, of course, call me David. Okay, well, I can now. You had had to tell me it was okay first. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your willingness to come on the show and, and talk about martial arts. I say it often. I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to other martial artists about martial arts and somehow lump it under the guise of work. That is very, very cool. And I know many of the professional martial arts instructors feel the same way about their work, that they get to hop on the mat every day or, you know, hop into the dojo and do what they love. And that's a great thing. Well, what's that saying? Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I mean, that's really how it feels. Right. Now, let's go back. We always, almost always, I shouldn't say we always start here, but we almost always start here. And it's a good launch point because everyone answers this question so differently if we really dig into it. And that question, of course, is, how did you get started in martial arts? So I'm 57 years old, still actively training and competing um, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu right now. But I started when I was six years old. um, My parents put myself and my older brother into a uh, jiu-jitsu, what I guess we would now call Japanese jiu-jitsu. By then, back then it was just, it was jiu-jitsu. Um, class at a local community college uh, in the Los Angeles area where I grew up. Um, my bro- I was six years old. My brother was nine, and he was having some problems with bullies. He wore glasses, and we had a cousin who was a black belt under this very well-known local instructor, uh, a guy named Jack Secchi. Um, and so uh, they thought it would be good to get us both enrolled. And so I kind of came as a tag along, but that's why I started at that young age. And my brother eventually got what he needed and, you know, trained for maybe a couple of years, moved off. I, of course, stuck with it and really, really liked it. And that's what sort of kept me going. And I've been doing it ever since. Now, I'm I'm doing the math because you, you know, you, you said your age. There weren't a whole lot of people training as young children back then. You know, um... Back, this would have been like 1969. I was born yeah. in 62. So there certainly was, I mean, there. I'm just trying to remember. I don't know what else was out there when I was a kid. I know that, um, you know, we were heading into the era, era of Bruce Lee movies <laughs> and Chuck Norris was soon to come. And so certainly in my teens and growing up in my teens, martial arts was a thing. And there were karate schools and and you know, taekwondo schools and kung fu schools. Um, but I guess at that age, I don't know. It, it wasn't a dedicated children's class for sure. We were all in one class. I do think there were some other kids in the class, but the way Master Seki taught had everybody in one group. And ah, I wasn't really conscious of whether other people did it or not. It was just this thing that I did. What are your memories from that time? You know, I would imagine that classes 
back then, especially a mixed class might have, you know, likely were, were run differently and uh, maybe more hardcore, traditional. I mean, does that sound yeah. fair? Master Seki, people just called him Seki. Um, he was half Japanese, half American. I think his father was an American serviceman who was served somewhere in Japan in, in the war and married a Japanese woman. And so he had sort of a mix of cultures, but he was very stern. Um, or at least he had a very stern outside. He, he had a kind of a soft inside that I saw over the years, and I could tell that he kind of had a sweetness to him. But in terms of how he presented and presented to the students, it was very authoritarian and, you know, very high sensei, you know, yes, sensei, you know, and, and no talking back. And he, it, it's, I mean, if I tr try to remember, I mean, my memories are from being a little bit older with him, but I know that he would, you know, demonstrate a technique. He would take us through rigorous warm ups the whole class and lots of calisthenics. He was a big believer in serious calisthenics, maybe half an hour of workout before we ever got to jujitsu. Um, and then he would show a technique, he would work it, he would, you know, similar to I think what's done in a lot of schools today, he would cir circulate around the class and, and assist. But he definitely was quite authoritarian. I mean, there would be periods where then he would have us sit and he would just like look and not say anything. And it was creating almost an uncomfortable silence in the room. And he would just be looking at us and you weren't sure like, is he mad? Is he thinking? And, but that kind of, I guess, I guess I would call it a little bit of fear he instilled. And certainly in me as a kid, I, I never was fearful that he would hurt me or d dislike me or anything, but he just commanded an authority that I do think was kind of normal back then. And certainly from some of the more traditional Asian martial arts. And, and honestly, he earned it. Uh, he was an extraordinary man. He was, he was small in stature um, and was extraordinarily good at jujitsu. In fact, I can relate to you a couple of stories that I remember that I think you'll appreciate. Please. Um, I remember there's two stories that stand out in my mind. One was he was never late to class. And believe me when I tell you, and you can understand this when I tell you he was you know, authoritarian, you were not late to class. You did not come late to class. If you step, I don't even think he would let anyone put a toe on the mat if once he bowed us in, you came. That was your problem. Um, and if you missed classes, he would cut you. Um, one of the things that he, I think that he valued was he might have been being paid something by the local community college, but he didn't owe you anything. Like it, it wasn't that you were coming and paying him a lot of money and now he had to teach you. He was teaching you because he wanted to teach you. And if he did not like teaching you, you were cut from the class. Um, and I, I carried that with me when I started teaching too, that, that sort of ethic, which I did like. Although I do see the value of if you're going to do it professionally, people do need to pay you and then you do owe them something in return. But there was something special about you didn't owe him anything. You paid your $5 a month or whatever to the, to the local college, and that was that. And so he would never, ever be late. Um, and there was one night when he didn't show up and we all were stunned and concerned and, and had no idea what could have happened to him, you know, and, and I think maybe 15 minutes into when the class should have started, actually one of the black belts started the class on time and started the warm ups. and about 15 minutes into when he, when he, uh, after we should have started, he came sort of limping into class and he had been walking to uh, the dojo, which he always did, uh, to the uh, community college. And apparently he had stepped on a nail that punctured 100% through his foot. He, it went all the way through his foot and he pulled it out and it slowed his walking down a little bit because he had to bandage it. And he came walking into class <laughs> and he taught class. I, I, as I recall, I think we were, I mean, the adults there, I was a kid, were insisting that he go get a tetanus shot. But um, he taught class, and then he went off to the hospital and got his tetanus shot. But I just remember thinking, I could not believe that the, the only reason that would make him late to class is literally a nail had gone through his foot, and he was very apologetic that it had caused him to be late to class. And to him, in his mind, it was no excuse. But it did take him a little time to get the nail out and to bandage it up and then to go back and continue his walk to class. It was just... To me, that was a testament to this guy's indomitable will. 
um, and certainly an inspiration to us. And another story I remember is about once a year, we would do a um, presentation for the parents, for the people, you know, sort of an exhibition. And we would do it in, in the class and you would invite all your friends and your parents to come and see it. And we would each have decided, you know, which moves we were going to demonstrate. And he did not teach uh, board breaking as part of anything I remember with jujitsu, but obviously he had some history with it because on these times when he would, um, when we would invite our parents and do this kind of a, uh, an exhibition, he would break boards and it was always very impressive to us. And he, um, so it, at this time he had taken, I don't know if it was pine. It was, it was real boards, like not easy boards to break. And he, uh, did some board breaking. And as you do, you know, he like did one, did two, did three. Then he put together five boards. So these were five, I guess, one inch thick boards. It was really thick. And to, to, to hold it securely, they took, took some masking tape and, and put a masking tape around both edges, both ends of the boards, and one in the middle, just to give it a little more stability. And this was going to be his sort of finale. And he had a student uh, hold it high, like chest level, and brace themselves holding it. And he was going to break it with, a, with his forehead, a forehead strike. And, and we were all amazed and concerned and confident he could do it. Um, and so he struck his forehead against the boards and they didn't break. And it was, you, you could hear like a little bit of a, hmm, you know, that was strange, you know, for, from the crowd. And he looked a little confused. And um, he said, all right. So he like gathered up his energy again. The student could brace himself again. And he struck the forehead, you know, the forehead strike against the board again. And it didn't break. And so he took a deep breath, gathered his energy. And one more time, he struck it. And this time, he was bleeding from his forehead. Um, and the boards did not break. And he was contrite and shrugged and said, well, I tried. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And he dismissed everybody. And they went home. And, you know, he put a little, you know, dabbed his, you know, the blood off of his forehead. And when we were cleaning up, and sweeping and cleaning up from the other board breaks, somebody took the tape off of the middle of the boards, of these five one-inch pine boards that was holding it. And it turns out what, what happened was the boards fell apart and dust poured out from where that middle of the tape was. So he had broken the boards. He had, he had liquefied the boards. He had just demolished the boards. But the tape, that the, the masking tape, there was nothing sharp enough in the way the boards break to actually call it, cause the masking tape to, to tear. So the masking tape was holding now two sets of boards together with, with sawdust in between them. And it was so amazing to me. And of course, then it made sense. The, he, he broke the board the first time and he, and he just continued to bash them, but it was this little bit of masking tape. And the lesson I got from that was, first of all, that Seki was seriously tough and that the energy he could put through was uh, impressive and real. The second thing I got from it was um, his contriteness, his, you know, he gave it three tries, he shrugged, he smiled, he said, well, can't win them all, you know, he, he took the defeat. And the third thing, of course, was how something as small as a little bit of tape in the right position in the right place can be very powerful, which is, you know, sort of a concept in jujitsu anyway of, you know, the right pressure, the right angle, the right thing in the right place has an outsized power and that little strip of tape does too. But I just remember those. And that's the kind of guy that Seki was. He was just tough as nails. That's a phenomenal story. I, I, can, I can imagine being there. And I don't know how many people listening have missed a break, but it hurts. And it hurts even more when you have people watching. And did he, did he know when you were cleaning up that he had, in fact, broken the boards? Yes. Well, well, no, he didn't know that he'd broken the board, but he was there when we were still cleaning up. And so he saw, he, he saw what we saw, that he had broken the board. I don't remember his reaction to that. Mm. He, he probably didn't care. I mean, but, um, I, I would suspect yeah. from from what you're saying that you know there wouldn't have been any any outward expression. Yeah, but I can't say I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen a break resulting in sawdust. Well, and, and I'm not saying I don't believe. I'm saying that's pretty powerful, and and the to kind of get back up after missing or believing that you've missed a break. 
and do yeah, it again so I, and do I it again. I don't do board breaking. I never have. I've never trained in a, a style. Um, I've I've been a jujitsu person and had and spent a number of years in in some styles of kung fu, but I've never done a style that did any board breaking. So I don't know it myself. But my impression is that usually you don't tape the middle of the boards. So usually, well, you probably don't tape them at all. Um, but um, but maybe because we didn't do a lot of board breaking and maybe the person holding the boards wasn't skilled in holding boards and, you know, maybe was going to, uh, you know, twitch or something. He thought it was best to tape the boards into, into one block. But I don't recall seeing people break boards where there's tape in the spot where they're trying to break the board. And I think that was why the sawdust thing happened. I think what happened was the boards were broken and then were broken again and they were broken again. And just the energy and the smashing of his head into that same place on the boards was just, you know, breaking the boards more and more and more. And it just was, they weren't being allowed to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. There's a reverence in the way that you're talking about him that I, I find really interesting because it's, it's not the words you're using. It's just, it's the tone. How long did you train with him? So um, I do have a reverence for him, uh, as does honestly anybody who ever encountered him or trained with him. Um, I trained with him, gosh, through my younger years, you know, grade school. I think, I don't know exactly the years. There was a period of time when I stopped uh, training with him and therefore stopped training jujitsu. I'm going to say maybe, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. Then around high school time, I went back and continued training with him. And after high school and to college, I was still training with him. And he had moved to a different community center at that time. And that was sort of my relationship changed a little bit because I was a bit more of an adult at that time and could see him as an adult. But um, I uh, do have a reverence for him a lot. He instilled in me some things that stay with me to this day. Um, definitely the, a, a sense of stoicness, of, you know, don't complain, just do the work and get it done. And, you know, he's not a complainer. Um, a level of integrity, which I don't think I match, but I would aspire to match. You know, he, if he says it, he's going to do it. He would be there on time. Deep respect. Um, just He was just so solid as a, as a person and as a, a, a warrior, really. Um, his technique as a small, you know, a person of a small diminutive size and his ability to throw people and throw people hard to the ground. He used to tell us that you're always armed. You're armed with the ground. And... He said, it's, you know, it's better than a club. It's better than a, nice, than a knife because you can hit someone with the earth. And what he meant by that is you could throw them if you want headfirst into the ground and coming from you know, five feet high in the air, however they are when you throw them, they're not going to get up. And um, he, he was so powerful at that and such a small guy to make it happen. And also he instilled in us a sense that has definitely stuck with me of defending the underdog, uh, you know, whether that be the less powerful in society, you know, children, yourself, of course, you're going to defend, but, you know, women, you know, wh whoever is in the situation or just the person who's being ganged up on, um, he had this really powerful moral sense. And he would tell us that w w if you get into trouble, you don't need to call for help. You are the help. You are the help that other people call for. That, so he wasn't saying don't call the police if you need to call the police and need help. But what he was saying is you need to foster in yourself an attitude of self-reliance that if someone else needs help, you are the person that they would call on. You don't need to call on anyone. You are the help, if you get what I mean. And um, he would say that people, when you're walking down the street or when you walk into a room, everybody on that street or everybody in that room should be safer because you're there, even if they don't know it. That you, the room just got safer because you entered it, and that's an ethic, and that's a commitment to you know if something bad is happening, don't run away. You know, get into it, jump into the problem, solve the problem. And um, yeah, you're you're right. I have a, a deep reverence for him, and he gave me those he gave me that um ethic and that stays with me in my work which is actually my professional work is not martial arts it's in animal 
welfare and animal protection, which to me is just a, a extension of protecting the, un, the, literal, the literal underdog in this case, but the, the weak and those who can't speak for themselves, the innocent. And yeah, Jack Secchi was an institution. He was amazing. And where did you go from there? I get the sense that he's likely passed on. Yes, he's, he's okay. passed away. So after I reconnected up with him, uh, like I mentioned in high school, I was still training jujitsu. This was a, what we would have called a, not a traditional style of jujitsu. So with the advent of Brazilian jujitsu, people start calling anything that's not Brazilian jujitsu, Japanese jujitsu or traditional jujitsu. But of course there are traditional styles of jujitsu. There's jujitsu has been around a long time uh, as the parent art of Aikido, the parent art of uh, judo. And there are certainly schools that have very, you know, codified lists of techniques and they practice them in a very formalized way with a uke and a tore, you know, the person who is, will be the attacker and the person will be the defender. And it's sort of a, you know, v- very controlled. There's not like sparring going on. Um, Seki was not that way. Um, he didn't have a set curriculum. Um, there was no particular techniques you needed to learn to get to your next belt. It was all just based upon his sense and his feeling and where you were at. Um, and we did do what he called randure. So we did um, spar uh, and we did uh, do, uh, you know, judo style uh, sparring without striking. We did some striking. So he, it was quite an eclectic, I wanted, I would say a hard style of jujitsu um, that we did. And I appreciated that. And I felt that it, it put me in good stead as a fighter um, in the couple of experiences I had growing up in school. When I got into fights, I easily, easily won. Um, and so that was good for me. But uh, in high school, I had a couple of friends who were interested in training Kung Fu. And I thought that would be interesting. And so we went down to a local school uh, taught by a guy named Sifu Douglas Wong. And if you're a Kung Fu aficionado, Douglas Wong is you know, well known there. And, and his wife, Carrie Ogawa, actually wasn't his wife then. Um, and he had a number of people, James Liu, um, a guy named James Brown, um, who were very, very prominent, extraordinary Kung Fu people who it forms. And so kata, essentially. And it didn't interest me that much, but it was kind of fun. And my friends were doing it, so I did it. And for me, it was more exercise, like just staying in deep stances and being able to hold stances and learning the different forms was fun. I did note that, you know, like Tuesday nights, um, we had at the Kung Fu school what we called fighting class. And in fighting class, we put gloves on and we were basically kickboxing. And I remember asking Sifu, like, if, if fighting class is us throwing round kicks and, you know, straight kicks and, and, and you know, boxing, essentially, what's all, what's the mantis stuff and the tiger claw stuff and, uh, and the crane, is that not fighting too? And, you know, he kind of smiled about that. And he said, look, these are all fighting moves, but, you know, they are, they are, because no, nobody, you know, like reared up into a crane stance and did a snap kick when we were in fighting class with gloves on, you know, it looked a lot more like standard kickboxing, but I appreciated that. But he, he, but uh, I did like the forms of it and I loved that, but, but jujitsu was always my route. And then when I went to, um, when I went and, and I, he didn't, they didn't have belts uh, there uh, in his school. So there was a black belt or a black sash he would award, which I never, I didn't stay that long. I was there for a number of years throughout high school and remained friends with uh, him. But um, there was no belt ranking for the students, but I did like work my way into the advanced class where we were doing the advanced forms. Um, I can tell you some funny stories from that too. We used to do balance things. He would fill up um, large coffee tins, like the, I don't know what, how big it would be because I don't drink coffee, but a, a large coffee tin, maybe you know six, seven inches across, uh, fill it up with concrete. And then we would stand on them, like, like you're standing on a pole and you'd be a few inches off the ground um, because you're on this can. And we would do, you know, balance things and extend the kicks from there. And then if you were good, like his best students were, you would put two or three of them stacked up and do your balance things there where you could really hurt yourself if, if you fall off of that. And whenever someone would fall, he would always, this is Doug Wong, he would always say, you know, be careful, you're going you're gonna to hurt my cans. Um, jokingly, like he was more concerned with the concrete can than whether you sprained your ankle or not. Because he's like, your ankle will heal, but that's my can. Um, <laughs> so he, he was funny. But uh, I then, when I w- went to UCLA as an undergraduate, um, they had a jujitsu program and they didn't have an instructor really. I mean, it was, it was kind of a club. 
And I actually did. Uh, it was it was a woman who was training in a style called Donzon Ru Jiu Jitsu. But when I showed up, it didn't take very long until they asked me to start teaching. Um, and I think that's because I was just technically good and tough, and they liked the style. And so, and that's when I really got deeply back into Jiu Jitsu. Began teaching Jiu Jitsu at UCLA. Um, I can keep going on because I've, I've done a few other things. If, if you're interested for me to just trace my history, absolutely. Where I, I ended mean, up today. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're hearing about your history, but we're, we're taking some side roads. And I think we're learning a tremendous amount about you and what's important to you as we go. So I don't, I don't see any reason to change. Well, and I'm happy to circle back on any of this stuff. But yeah, um, So I was teaching at UCLA and that, this was all not, not paid, which to me, again, I didn't have experience with professional martial arts instructors. So for me, there was sort of a, a, a nobleness in showing up each day and teaching class and not being paid for it and therefore not feeling like I owed anyone anything. Like I'm the instructor. You owe me respect. I owe you good instruction and being a good instructor, but, but you don't come and pay me money. And now I have to perform for you because you paid me money. That was my attitude towards paying for martial arts instruction. And as I say, I've since, you know, come a, a very different attitude of that and absolutely realized the value of having a professional martial arts instructor for whom he needs to or she needs to feed their family and themselves. And there's nothing at all wrong with paying to teach martial arts. But back then I was very proud of the fact that I just showed up. I did it for, as a volunteer thing. And in 1984, um, in, in Los Angeles, the Olympics came to the city of Los Angeles and the Olympic uh, committee for the, for their various activities took over a lot of the sporting facilities in the city and UCLA was part of that. And so we lost our, our map basically for the summer of 1984. We couldn't train at UCLA because the Olympics. So I had to find us another mat that we could rent somewhere. And I picked up the phone book and, you know, mats were not easy to, that easy to find back then. Uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu didn't exist in the United States. And so basically I'd be looking for a judo school that wanted to you know, rent out some space, maybe after their class for my Jiu-Jitsu class. And I went through the phone book and I saw this place near my house, which was in um, the San Fernando Valley, part of Los Angeles. And I had never seen this school. I, it, it must have been new. And it was an Aikido school. And I thought, oh, they'll have mats. It was called Tenshin Dojo. And I uh, called up uh, and said, hey, I'm a jiu-jitsu instructor at UCLA. We lost our thing. We need to rent space. Can I rent the space? And the person who answered said, well, you're going to have to talk to Sensei about that. He's quite traditional. He'll, he'll want to meet you. And so I went down there um, and, and, and they said, bring someone to work out with, bring a, a partner. So I brought one of my black belt friends down. We went to this dojo we had never heard of and walked into it. And it was gorgeous. And it was very traditional and had tatami mats. It was deep. They filled up a whole warehouse. It had a, a, like a Shinto um, altar at the end of it. And I could see, wow, this is quite formal. And I w we were sitting in this sort of entry room with the, you know, the door open outside. It was a sunny day. And suddenly the room was darkened by this very large man who filled the, the doorway, blocking the sunlight. And I remember thinking like, whoa, who is this? And it was a guy named Steven Siegel at the time. And I'd never heard of him. No one had ever heard of him. This is, of course, Steven Seagal. And um, he had just come back from Japan. He was a fifth Don. Uh, I think he was the first ever promoted to fifth Don um, in Aikido. He was the real deal for sure in Aikido. And he was extremely intimidating <laughs> um, and scary, but you know, allowed me to show my stuff. And he was impressed enough. And he said, okay, I, I think your, your quality, you can teach after my classes. And that became a friendship and a relationship that I had with Steven Seagal. This was, as he was starting to meet people, he had he had a desire to be in the movies and he quickly started to kind of infiltrate the Hollywood scene. And, and I remember Jackson Brown, uh, the musician was a student of his. I saw him teaching him. A few other musicians came down and then I was uh, with him still teaching there when his first movie above the law, I think it was called came yes. out and he took me to the, took me to the uh, screening at the Grauman's Chinese theater. And since we, we've since drifted apart, I, um, uh, but so I'm not in touch with, uh, Master Segal today, but that was interesting. And uh, then I eventually got con I got connected up with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And again, I'll pause if you have any questions. But Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is what I've been doing for the last uh, sure. twenty five years. Sure, and and I suspect that this is a uh, probably be a transitional point in our conversation. So yeah, let's let's go back a, a little bit. Uh, obviously, anyone who is willing to to get past 
some of the more modern criticisms of Steven Seagal uh, with regard to either movies or politics or, you know, his, his personal health or, um, you know, the, the TV show that he did, you know, if, if you can get past that, he's a big guy and he accomplished a lot of things. And, you know, your, your description of the, the door, the door being darkened, obviously I wasn't there, but it sounds like that's such an appropriate way to describe it because you're talking about him in his prime. Yeah, he was, he, yes, this was before he was an actor. He was, he was a martial artist back then for sure. Did you train with him at all? Yeah. Um, well, not, like? not seriously as a student, we got on the mat together a number of times, but I never, and I would, you know, cause I wanted to show respect. And if I was going to teach, well, so I never was ranked with him. I'm trying to remember now I did come. I felt it would be disrespectful for me to show up after this Aikido master would teach his class and walk and me, some just run of the mill jujitsu black belt, walk onto the same mat, start teaching my people. I felt like a, it would be disrespectful and B it would be stupid for me because there's an Aikido master in front of me. Why would I not be learning from him? So I never officially embraced Aikido, but um, there was in those years, I would frequently come to the class and in a white belt and do, take his class from him and then put my black belt on after the class and then teach the jujitsu class. And um, so the reason I said no, that I didn't train with him is I never really felt that I was a student. I never really committed to learning Aikido as a style. I'm not ranked at all in Aikido, but I took advantage of the opportunity he was giving me to be on the mat with him. And mm. um, that was very impressive. As you say, he was very large, I don't know, six something big guy, broad shoulders. And he used that very effectively in his Aikido. So he would move very, very well and very efficiently. And if you made any sort of a lunge at him, he would send he would send you flying for real send you flying and um he had a a black belt that he had brought with him from um japan a guy named matsoka who uh spoke very little english although he learned it at the time and matsoka was really his punching bag man matsoka was not his size either so he would just demonstrate on matsoka and sometimes he would very frequently he would uh, you know allow a a elongated you know demonstration like he would, uh, he would start the class. There would be some sort of warm up. Then we'd all sit quietly, sitting you know on our knees in seiza. He would summons Matsoka to stand up, and he would just like elicit an attack from Matsoka. He would just say, you know, come at me. And Matsoka would throw a strike, and Matsoka would throw a kick, and Matsoka would reach, and he would just defend and throw and throw and throw and throw and throw and joint lock and throw. And then at some point he would maybe hit upon the thing he wanted to teach us. I don't know how he was deciding. And the last thing you saw him do, that was the thing he then started talking about and pop. So Matsoka would have just had a workout where we would have basically witnessed a demonstration about five minutes of Matsoka being tossed around in every move imaginable before we ended up with the one that we did. And, um, and then Sensei uh, would, uh, Segal would show it and then maybe teach a little bit and then walk off the mat. And we'd be on our own and Matsoka would be helping us, but he would literally walk off the mat, maybe sit down on a couch, get some water, and then come back on, show another technique, walk off the mat. And my understanding, I've never trained in Japan, but that's a traditional way to teach in Japan. Just the teacher shows it, you're on your own kind of a thing, um, which in my opinion is not the best way to teach at all. I, I believe in being a very engaged instructor, but that's not the style that he was doing. But yes, I did train with him and, and, and very, again, no, I, I, no talking about his politics, his movies, just anything about him as a person. I have no comment on any of that except to say he was extraordinarily good at Aikido. And that's what I'd always suspected. But you're the first person I've had the opportunity to speak with who did anything more than see him at a seminar. So yeah, no, I thanks know for, for indulging years. me. He's he's a real deal. Mm. This is all quite the foundation. I mean, we're we're really building up to something, and you know, you're showing that that. Time and again, you're going back to martial arts. You're finding opportunities for martial arts. It's, it's got some kind of hold on you. Were you aware of that at this point? Oh yeah, I've. I, it's always been part of my identity. I mean, since I was a little kid, um, mm. it's just part of who I am. Um, and uh, I was, bu you know, interestingly, even though I started and I was six years old, I was bullied a bit myself in grade school. 
um, you know, pushed, shoved in the hallway and always tried to like not get into fights. That's what Seki told us to do. Don't get into a fight. Um, and so sometimes I would just suck it up. Um, and, uh, but it definitely in, a, you know, I think this being bullied is a theme in a lot of the best martial artists, uh, martial artists I know. I do not count myself in that list of best martial artists, but I think it's a, it's a team, it's a, it's a theme and it certainly was for me. And so fighting, defending the underdog, all that stuff has always been part of who I am. There was never any question in my mind. Like when I went to UCLA, I was going to train jujitsu. Obviously I found out if there, if there was a martial arts program there, I was going to get involved in it because that's where I was going to be spending my time. I had to train. Um, and when I left UCLA, um, but y- y- I actually never went back to teaching at UCLA after um, the Olympics, by the way, because suddenly I was teaching at a place where regular people, my friends could come and train and they couldn't do that on the, on the UCLA campus. So the group that began training at Steven Seagal's, I ended up teaching there not just for the summer, but for several years. Um, And that became uh, my main place of teaching and charged only what was required to pay the rent to master Seagal and never took any money from that. Um, and that's when I first encountered Professor Wally J uh, and became a friend and student of Professor Wally J's, who's a small circle jiu-jitsu. He's also no longer with us, but for those in the jiu-jitsu world or in the Kaju Kembo world or some, some of the worlds of martial arts, they'll know who Professor Wally J was. And, um, and it was in 1990 that I was actually seeking something new and different. I felt like, you know, I'm pretty good at jiu-jitsu and you know, my incremental getting better at this is not going to get that much better. And I've been working small circle stuff with uh, Professor Wally J. And I wanted to do something different. And I had heard of Muay Thai. And I had just signed up to start taking Muay Thai classes when the first person who ever told me about the Gracies came into my school where I was still teaching at that time. By that time, I was volunteering at a different community center to teach because Tenshin Dojo had moved on. Um, and because Steven Seagal had like I'm his movie star and wasn't teaching at the school anymore. But, um, and I pivoted at that moment when, and I can tell you the story of my first exposure to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So I didn't continue my m- new Muay Thai training because I got completely enamored with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. When you look at those early days of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and you think about, you know, the things that you had that you were bringing into it, was it beneficial because you had that prior experience to lean on? Was it challenging because there were things you had to unlearn or maybe some mix of the two? There was nothing I had to unlearn in jujitsu. Um, it was all just a refinement and making things better. Um, I, uh, so I, it definitely gave me a leg up. Uh, when I first got on the mat, I put on a white belt. Uh, I'll, I'll relate to you the actual story of my first jujitsu lessons because I think you'll find it interesting and your listeners as well. Um, but um, I, I would say that my level coming in as an experienced jiu-jitsu black belt onto a Brazilian jiu-jitsu mat um, got me, the, the, the first level of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is blue belt. You might attain that, you know, after a year, depending on the school, or maybe a couple of years. Um, and so I was what I would call a bad blue belt. So if, if I was grappling competitively with the newer or not so good blue belts, I could beat them. I would catch them in some sort of a finishing hole. If I was training with an average blue belt or a good blue belt, they would beat me. Um, so that's so it did get me something. It didn't get me that much, but it got me, you know, bad blue belt. That's what I would say. And it definitely allowed me to move quicker through the ranks of jujitsu, just because I f- I felt comfortable with chokes. I felt comfortable inverting and you know, and, and, and being kind of twisted up. That was something I'd been doing since I was a child. It was just these guys were showing me much better ways and much better movements than I had been exposed to on the ground specifically um, for what, what, we, what I would have called at the time Nawaza, the ground technique. Um, and so it did help me and there was nothing, nothing I needed to unlearn. Honestly, the only thing I needed to unlearn was some of the decorum um, because I was, you know, bowing and uh you know try being very dis- and, and brazilian jiu-jitsu doesn't have a lot of that you know it's a little bit looser let's just say i can remember a time when i was training on the mat just was I don't know, when i was in, in the middle belt rank and higgin my coach um 
was, you know, kind of shouting for everyone to go harder, go harder. We were all sort of in matches all around the mat. And he took off his belt and he started using it like you would, you know, like you would wind up your towel and snap your towel in a, you know, in the gym when you were a kid, you know, to use it like a whip. He was using his belt like that and whipping people, like snapping it at them. And I remember just thinking like, this is so far away from the world I grew up in. Like you don't take your black belt off and snap it at someone. Like it was, and it just reminded me like, yeah, there's a different, this is a different, uh, you know, rules that, that apply here, you know, a different etiquette. Um, so I did have to unlearn some of that etiquette, you know, like I don't have to always bow and it's okay to like just sit and lean up against the wall instead of sitting Seiza in good posture and, um, but a lot of that etiquette that I, I, I carried with me really helped me. Like, for example, I believe that when the instructor said, start drilling, you started drilling and you just kept drilling immediately. You just didn't talk. You just drilled and drilled and drilled. And so I was able to you know, accomplish more reps than other people in the class because I wasn't living in that vibe that the instructors were putting out, which was kind of very relaxed. I came from a very structured thing. And so I used that structure and I think that actually helped me. I had a similar experience when I dabbled in BJJ and, and actually found that I, I, I don't know if I want to say I struggled, but my attitude, my traditional, my historical attitude to, towards training was so foreign to everyone else that I had a hard time fitting in. Yeah. Yeah. It was, no, it wasn't an issue for me, but I understand why that would occur. And the truth is, if you're coming from a hard style uh, or from a striking style, it can be hard. You know, jiu-jitsu is kind of very round and soft and pliable, mm -hmm. and it, it's not relying on explosiveness. It's not relying on speed or, you know, that kind of precision. It's sort of a different kind of precision. It's almost a lazy precision. Um, and um, that is hard for people who come from, you know, those di truly different styles to integrate into that. Um, but, you know, they do. And, and then, they, then, they get, then they get the benefit of their stand-up technique and the ground technique, and, and yeah. that's good for them if they do that. Um, just relaying how I got into jiu-jitsu, I think you might find it interesting. Um, so I had just begun my Muay Thai. I was teaching jiu-jitsu, again, not being paid, uh, at a local, it wasn't actually a community center. This was uh, a fencing school. They had fencing, but it, they wanted just a jiu-jitsu class, and so I had a jiu-jitsu class going on there, and it was good. And somebody walked onto my mat, an old student of mine, who said, hey, I've been training with this Brazilian guys, the, these Gracie brothers. Have you heard of them? And I'm like, no, I have no idea who they are. Um, this was long before the UFC. Um, and he said, they're unbelievably good. And he said, let me show you. I'll grapple with you. And this was a student of mine from years ago. And he grappled with me. And he was good. And he gave me a hard time. And he was a blue belt of theirs. And I was so impressed. Like, wow, I had a hard time. Like, getting you and choking you. And I beat him, but I'm like, and how long have you been training with these guys? He's like, well, I've been with them for like six months and seven months. And I, and he, and, and I said, wow, I really should check this out. And I made a note of it. Um, and then uh, I just, I didn't get around to it. Then another guy showed up on my mat, a guy I didn't know who was sort of menacing. And uh, he watched me teach a class. And afterwards he said, can we grapple? And I'm like, yes, I would never say no to a challenge like that. And he was a little bigger than me and he put on a gi and I had my gi on and we went for, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes before I finally got his back and choked him out. And he was tough. And I said to him, so, you know, who are you? He was wearing a white belt. And he said, I've been training with these guys, same thing, Gracie's. And I thought, wow. And I said, how long have you been training with him? And he said, three months. And I didn't believe him. I mean, he was a big, strong guy. Um, but I, I just didn't believe him. And he said, no, I'm not kidding. I've been training private lessons with Hicks and Gracie for three months. And I'm like, okay, I've got to check this out. And he gave me the videotape, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in Action, which was this VH videotape that um, Horian and Hickson were circulating um, to get known in the United States. And they compiled uh, a number of their fights in Brazil. And it was uh, narrated by Horian Gracie, who went on to start the UFC. Um, and... Um, I was impressed. I watched the videotapes, but I, I kind of thought like, well, I mean, they're good. They're, they're fighting people. They're doing jujitsu. I couldn't appreciate how good it was until the first day I finally got it together. Um, I, 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 oh, so I called actually Hickson and spoke to him briefly. And it was very expensive at the time. It was like $100 for a private lesson, which was in 1990. 
it was just like, wow, that's like really expensive to me. Like that's a month's training. Um, and of course I didn't understand how good he was and he's phenomenal. And I would have been smart to go, go, go take the lesson. But I also didn't like the, the ch- they had a challenge, the Gracie challenge that was like a hundred thousand dollars to anybody who could beat them. And it just wasn't my thing. I, I didn't like that. I didn't want to be associated with it. And then I contacted my original student and, and he said, Hey, no, no, his, his instructors are Gracie family. But it's Higgin Machado and Carlos Machado who were there at the time. They said they are, they're not doing the challenge. They're not like that. They're just totally cool. Um, and I thought, oh, that might work a little better for me. So I went, I found out where they were teaching. They had two schools and one of them was near me. And I showed up one night um, to meet them and to take a class. And they were not there. It was a heavy, heavy rains and the freeways were all jammed up. And they had asked a purple belt student of theirs to teach the class. But that's a mid-level. Um, and he was a guy in from Australia named John Will. And I had never heard of John Will and didn't know anything about it, but he was wearing a purple belt. So I decided, I asked if they had a white belt. I thought, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu, but I'm not going to like be a black belt on a mat where the purple belt is teaching as a sign of respect. I'll put on a white belt. It's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So I put on a white belt, which was a good thing I did because John kicked the crap out of me. He made me tap so many times. I could not believe what I was, what I, what I was experiencing. And I remember saying to him, if you're a purple belt, what are the black belts like? And he said, on a different planet. And then the next time I came, Higgin Machado was there and he played with me like, like I had never had a day of jujitsu in my life. He, he, he smothered me. He choked me out. He, got me in every joint lock and he did it with one arm and he was laughing and not getting out of breath. And that's all it took for me to decide, okay, I'm taking my black belt off and I'm putting my white belt on and I'm going to start training with these guys. And I continued teaching for maybe about a month. And after like a month or two of me continuing to teach my jujitsu and bringing all those students over to Higgin to try to support him, I closed my class down. I said, you guys, there's something better. And we, I'm going to, I'm going to become a student and I invite you to join me. And that was it. And then I devoted myself to Higgin and his brothers and, and um, moved through the ranks. And that was my entry to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That was like around 1990. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's a, that's a great story. And, you know, I, I want to I touch on something that you brought up because I don't want people listening to think that I'm down on PJJ because I'm not. I'm certainly not. There's a quality that by relaxing some of the formality you get these opportunities, these training sessions that have a levity to them where a black belt will play with you like a cat does a mouse. And it can be humorous, it can be fun, and it can be impactful. It can be humbling and at the same time very inspiring, which was my takeaway from the way you were describing it. Yeah, that was, that was it entirely. I mean, he didn't he didn't destroy my ego. We, didn't, we just played with me, and it was the fun. And there, and 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 remember, it was at a time when I had, was seeking something new. I was about to throw myself into Muay Thai, which would have been a great thing to to throw myself into. It would have introduced me to a, a whole new level of power, you know, of uh, kicks and stri- and elbow strikes, things like that. But um, but no, it, it attracted me. It was welcoming. They were friendly. They were respectful of me, respectful of my students. They were respectful of all martial arts. Uh, Higgin and, and his brothers, uh, who were Jean-Jacques, Carlos, Hajer, and John, there's five of them. And they eventually all came over from Brazil and, and came to California. Um, they were so deeply respectful. I mean, they, they weren't trying to prove anything. Higgin would take us to uh, judo classes, would take us to uh, uh, rest, Western wrestling classes, we went to, to other tournaments. Um, they were very, very respectful. They are, are very early on got linked up with um, Chuck Norris, and who really helped them and helped Brazilian Jiu Jitsu get a foothold in the United States. And you know, Chuck, of course, was coming from a different style. So there was all this mutual respect. And and the Machado brothers were never saying anything other than "We do what we do, and you're welcome to come and learn with us." They were always very open uh, to to anything new, and that and that was what allowed me to to embrace it. I didn't get any weird vibes from them ever Mm. at all. And, um, 
And I derive from jujitsu, but definitely from Brazilian jujitsu, I derive a whole set of rules. I mean, I can, I've given actually some presentations on this at conferences that are not relating to martial arts, but uh, relating to actual animal advocacy, which is, again, my profession, my chosen profession. Um, and, you know, all the lessons I've learned from jujitsu, and, and I could write a book on it. I mean, leave your ego at the door, um, look for a tipping point. Um, so you don't need you don't need to throw someone all the way onto their back. You just need to find the point at which gravity will take over. Um, know how to rest while you're still fighting. How to find moments of rest. Find good teachers. Um, don't you know? Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's so many life lessons. You know, look, when you're in a bad situation, and this one I got from my now great friend John Will, who is the who and who it turned out who went on to become the first. Australian to get a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and is still, in my opinion, the, the finest, you know, certainly one of the finest Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors anywhere in the world today. If any of your listeners ever get a chance to take a seminar with him or check out any of his books or anything like that, he is such a phenomenal teacher, a teacher's teacher, a coach's coach. You know, uh, just to divert for a moment, we all get good at our arts and then we start teaching, but it's not that anyone taught us how to teach. I mean, that's a whole separate skill. And he's got that skill. He really breaks it down and understands how to impart information to people in a way that they will learn it quickly. And hint, it's not show the technique once and then walk off the mat and let them figure it out for themselves. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, um, the, uh, the, the lessons that I learned, it was a lesson John taught me, um, look for 5% improvements. Like if you're in a bad situation, don't try to just toss the person off you. You'll waste your energy. 5% improvements. Improve your situation a little and then a little more and a little more. Just so many things I learned from jiu-jitsu that are useful in my animal advocacy, in my life, business. I really love it. And I'm sure every martial art has that, but jiu-jitsu is the one that I'm in, in and I've certainly derived from that. Let's talk about your profession because you've brought it up a couple times and, and you just mentioned how you've given presentations incorporating your martial arts into that. And I'm guessing that there are some other synergies. There. Yeah, well, um, you know, I jokingly tell people I have a, a, a business card, Kicking Butt and Saving Animals, because um, it seems odd to people like, oh, you're this fighter guy. And, and I definitely am embedded within sort of the UFC culture. Although I wouldn't call myself a fan, but many of my friends and uh, people I train are UFC fighters, successful UFC fighters. Um, and it, for example, I moved up, well, when I was down in Los Angeles, trained with Rico Rodriguez and a number of people down there. And then when I moved into San Francisco, which is the area I've been living now for the last 15 years, I've, you know, I trained with Jake Shields and Nick and Nate uh, Diaz and um, just a, a number of UFC fighters all coming out of the Caesar Gracie camp. Caesar's a, a buddy of mine. But um, so there's, you know, it's a fair amount of aggression and, and stuff, but then there's this caring for animals and caring for, you know, I'm, I'm a gentle person. I'm, I was a vegetarian, became vegan many, many years ago, decades ago. And so I'm, you know, the person who will escort the spider out of the house and not kill them, you know, and I don't see any discrepancy there at all. I think the, the greatest strength is gentleness. Uh, the ability to hold back, you know, like Schindler's List, I think, said it, the ability to destroy, but don't, but not. You know, for those of your listeners who are religious, you know, it's what, it's what God does. You know, God, we are so insignificant and he could easily destroy us, but a deity decides not to and instead is kind and compassionate. To me, that's the greatest strength. So to me, working to end animal cruelty and to represent, you know, living beings that suffer, that can't represent themselves is 100% in alignment with my fighting and my martial arts ethic which is exactly, you know, why I got into martial arts and why I stayed with it. Um, I began working at some point to, I just decided I want to spend my life, my daily life doing something meaningful. And I didn't want to teach martial arts for a living, not because I have any problem with being paid for it anymore. As I say, I got over that. I understood there's a great value in that. Um, but it was just that I was concerned that my love would become a daily grind. And I didn't want that to have happen. I didn't want my work to become, you know, to, to impinge upon the thing I do because I love it so much. And the people who are most successful find a way to make the business work, but also keep the fun in it for them. But I was concerned about that. So I decided I could always do jujitsu as an avocation or I guess avocation, but my vocation would be saving the world in other ways. And I eventually, um, 
founded and continue to run something called adoptapet.com, which is North America's largest homeless uh, pet adoption website. So animals that are in animal shelters, virtually every animal shelter or humane society in the United States and Canada posts their pets onto adoptapet.com and it's a central place that aggregates that information and it's free. And you can you know, search for a particular type of dog or cat or rabbit or whatever you're looking for. And instead of having to drive to different animal shelters or look at all these different websites, it gives you a chance to find it easy in one place. And we really, really help save hundreds of thousands of animals in that way. Um, and my love for animals goes well beyond companion animals. As I mentioned, I, do, I don't eat uh, any animal products. That's a personal decision of mine. That has worked really well for me over the years. I, I really do feel that that's been key to my continuing. You know, I've, I've got eight Brazilian Jiu Jitsu World Championships and I continue to compete at 57 years old. And I'm training daily with, you know, college wrestlers. And these guys are tough and they're young and they're hard. And, and I've definitely taken my dings uh, and my injuries, but I very much credit my diet, um, my a very clean diet for helping me have this longevity in the martial arts and helping keeping my energy level up and my recovery time quick. Um, it's really, really worked for me. Um, so I, you know, advocate it. I don't sit around talking about it, you know, what people should eat it's kind of their own business, but I do feel that, you know, for people who are interested in um, exploring sort of what are the real outer limits of what's possible with their body, they ought to give uh, meat reduction, animal product reduction a try. Uh, and then their body will decide for themselves. Actually, when Jake Shields, who has been vegetarian his entire life, never eaten meat uh, in his life, um, he was fighting with George St. Pierre for the UFC title. I tossed up a website, which is still up, called fuelforthefighter.com, just because I thought it would be easier for him to just say, go, go check this website out, because you know, fighters aren't always that articulate and don't, you know, that's not the subject of the interview what they're eating. And that's still up there. And that basically has just some ideas of an attitude towards why it might make sense to do it and, and how you would like how you would reduce the stuff in your diet. But for me, it's, I do believe it works for me uh, as a health thing, but it's, it's an ethical thing for me. Um, I just, for, for me personally, again, I'm not trying to preach to anybody else, but for me personally, I don't want to harm an animal if I don't have to. And I'm, I've now shown after decades that I don't have to for my food. So to me, that works really well. And interestingly, that was another thing that attracted me to the Gracie uh, family because Carlos Gracie, the uh, patriarch of the family, uh, along with his uh, brother, Elio Gracie, uh, he was a nutritionist and he was a vegetarian. And the whole Gracie family in Brazil, all those times when they were doing all those Vale Tudo, no rules fights, they're vegetarian. Um, now, a lot of the family members have adopted more of a standard American diet when they came to the West. So they've added, you know, maybe lean meats, chicken. But... Um, that always interested me and definitely worked very well for my kind of moral thing. It's really interesting. And, and we're, we're in this interesting time where we're having a lot more discussion about nutrition and how it relates to our choices. And you're, you're probably aware of the documentary, The Game Changers. I'm, uh, not only am I aware of it, I'm friends with J uh, James Wilkes, of course, oh, okay. uh, who's, who did it. And I know the okay. people who funded it. And I, I think it's phenomenal. I highly recommend it. James was it. on the show not too long ago. Okay. Yeah. So James is up. awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a good guy. And um, yeah, I am. And I think it's very sound and very interesting to watch. And I think it will really give uh, people a pause as to what advantages they might be able to get if they switch to even just a more plant-based diet. I mean, I, I'm not a believer, even the term vegan or vegetarian, it, it, it connotes kind of a lifestyle. I mean, it brings up other things in people's minds. I don't know, hippie, uh, maybe annoying person with vegan, you know, I mean, I, I get it. Um, and I feel like, um, you know, it's not about being this or that. It's about a diet. You know, like, what are you going to eat? You don't have to become vegan or become vegetarian. Or I, I know some people who eat very little animal products in their diet, but they're not vegan. So, but they're much closer to me than the average, you know, person who's eating hamburgers every day. So why do, why don't, isn't there there's not a word for them? So now you hear like flexitarian, reducitarian for just a person who's trying to reduce, you know, their animal consumption in their diet, usually for health reasons. Um, although there's really strong environmental reasons too. I mean, it's, it seems kind of crazy, but the, the, there's so much uh, waste that goes into the production of animal products to get the nutrients that we need. 
they're basically consuming the plants that we could consume anyway. And, um, and so now what's happening with the rising concern for our environmental and global warming, climate change, things like that, it's being, you know, people are seeing the, the, the incredible effect that especially cows, um, but chickens, uh, other animal products as well have on the environment because the environmental cost for that. So I think that's driving interest in this and it's certainly driving governments to be interested in maybe promoting more of a plant-based diet. Um, I'm a big, I'm happy to see that that is catching attention and I'm really happy to see that, um, you know, for a lot of people, they'd be fine to consume a little bit less meat, but it's not clear to them how to do it. And well, what does that mean I eat? You know, people say, well, what am I supposed to eat? Salads, carrots. And obviously, you know, there's your normal burrito, but just don't have the chicken or the beef. Just have, you know, have beans. Beans are a great source of protein. Or, you know, obviously salads, but pastas and Thai food and Indian food. I and mean, there's just so many foods to eat that you just don't have that little chicken in it or you just don't have a little meat in it. But now you've got these uh, products like uh, Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger and many products are available in sort of the more whole foods type markets that are trying to replicate the taste and the texture of meats to make it easier for people to eat less meat. And, and they're quite good. And a lot of my meat eating friends really like them and they're substituting them in now. And it's much less, much better for the environment. It's not as healthy as just, you know, eating plant-based food. It is a processed food, but it's healthier than the meat it's trying to replace because there's no growth hormones or concentrated pesticides or antibiotics or any of that stuff or cholesterol in those products. Um, so it's a good step, you know, for someone who is, is a heavy meat eater and wants to cut down a bit and just wants to get an impossible Whopper, you know, at Burger King, do it. I mean, that's good. It's a, it's a good first step. And, but I think that people, I've never met anyone who didn't reduce animal product consumption, who didn't feel that they, um, that they felt better afterwards and didn't like the feeling of it. Um, I've met a few people who went like, all all vegan who then sort of backed off of that a little bit uh although i know many more who haven't but i just think it's a personal thing i definitely think it's you know we talk about self-defense as martial artists you know the basic form of self-defense is staying alive and you know heart attacks <laughs> heart disease is the number one killer Can cancer i believe is number two and both of these have a lot to do with your behaviors and your diet choices so i think it's very much in accordance with our desire to both protect ourselves um, uh, and defend ourselves and defend our families and defend our nation to engage in behaviors that are helpful for ourselves and for our nation and for our planet. And to me, um, being open to at least, you know, cutting down a little bit, if not entirely eliminating animal products is a big part of that. Let's talk about the future. You know, we, we've, we've really had a great view into you and your life and, and the things that are important to you and how martial arts is threaded through all of them. And in fact, I suspect at some points has not been a thread, but the, the motivator, the, the impetus. But as you look into the future, you know, you're, you're talking about the way you're conducting your training now, you know, it sounds like it's still pretty intense. So that makes me wonder how long are you planning to do that? Or is that an indefinite thing? Yeah, that's an indefinite. I'll keep training as long as I can. You know, and I've talked about this, I mentioned John Will, um, he, he writes a blog and, and has really interesting posts and stuff like this. And we've discussed this because I took a path. Um, we, we became partners and, and early on, we actually developed a curriculum that was in use in, oh, I don't know, a thousand different Taekwondo, karate, you know, non-Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools that wanted to offer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu before there were Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructors. So this was DVDs and stuff. And at the time, and, and when I was building adoptabet.com and didn't have any funding or money, I would be making money by traveling and teaching seminars for those people who bought our curriculum. And so, but then we turned, you know, once I was able to make a living in the animal, I, I took that as my job. And John stays as a professional martial arts instructor, got many schools, got a big association. So we talk about this. And for me, the driver was always competition. There's always another competition coming up. There's always another championship. And that's what sort of keeps me pushing and interested. John never got really into competition. He did a few competitions, but you know, his, the driver for him is the, the puzzle, the learning new things in, in, in all martial arts in general. He's an extremely accomplished uh, stand-up fighter, but, um, and he teaches that at his school too. He teaches a mix of stand-up fighting and, um, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But, 
certainly on the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, he's very much gotten into that. And so for him, what drives him is the constant puzzle, this what's the newest thing and how do you stop it? And I appreciate that too, but I don't get to immerse in that as much because I'm not on the mat as a teacher. You know, I'm on the mat to get my training in and with fighters. And so I probably, as I need to taper down the competition and, you know, like I say, we all have our injuries and I also just don't have the time to train. And there's new people coming up, even if I compete in my age division, I have an advantage because I have this, you know, I was one of the first American black belts. I have a, a lot of knowledge and training experience, but I also have a lot of damage, uh, joint damage. And so somebody who's, you know, competing, who's also 57 years old, but they've only been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for, you know, 10 years and they brought a very healthy body to it. They don't have as much damage as I do having done it now for, you know, about 30 years. So um, there is a point now where I'm starting to think, you know, maybe I should start teaching again a little bit just to give myself a reason to stay current. And, and um, you know, I could see that it, switching to not the next competition being the thing that's making me want to get on the mat, but learning the next move or solving the next move. And, you know, I am involved in that. I'm current. I, I see, I train at a lot of different places. So I always like to say, you may be able to beat me, but not with something I've never seen. <laughs> so, and that's not always true, but it usually is true because I train, I specifically buzz around to a lot of different schools. I'm pretty current on the grappling, but that doesn't mean that I'm good at it or can teach it. I can maybe defend against the latest thing. But um, so I think I could see that in my future. I do enjoy the training. I enjoy the camaraderie. I enjoy getting with younger guys on the mat. Um, that's always fun. And I will, you know, I'll continue to compete so long as it's fun. Um, recently I've been backing off a little bit because I say just my work has been so busy. I don't have the time to train and, and I have a high expectations for myself. So when I don't win, I, I you know, I, it's hard for me to accept that. Um, and of course, you know, I, I give all the greatest, you know, respect to the people who, who I compete with, whether I beat them or not, I need them and they need me. And there's a great camaraderie at my level in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but you know, winning is fun. But uh, it's not everything, and especially when I'm competing, you know, to be the number one in the world at the 55-year-old age division, you know, that's great, but it's, it doesn't, I'm not number one in the world, you know. And so I, uh, I, like, uh, I like the concept of maybe switching a little more back into some teaching for some fun of it. Certainly my friends who I drop in on their classes are always happy to have me teach. If I say, hey, I want to teach technique, they'll step aside and let me do that any day of the week. So that's probably more of that in my future. And you've mentioned a couple of the things that you've put up online. If you could just run through all those now, website, social media, anything that people sure. might want to connect on. Well, yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not terribly accessible online, like I say, because I'm not teaching. I'm not trying to promote anything myself. Um, I did, uh, you know, adoptapet.com. Obviously, that's where I work for. And if anyone uh, in the U.S. or Canada is looking for a pet, I would hope that you would give us a look. It's free. Check out the animals in your local shelter before you go, um, you know, purchasing an animal a different way. You might be able to find exactly the pet you're looking for. And so I certainly promote adoptapet.com. Um, I, uh, that website I tossed up that I mentioned fuel for the fighter.com. Um, that is, uh, that's fuel for the fighter.com. That's got some interesting information on it. Um, I, you know, I don't keep, haven't kept it up to date, but I think it's good for a young man or anybody who's a fighter that's interested in, in that. I also did a video on the food subject, a short video that uh, lives on a website called thesmarterdiet.com. That's just something I threw up there that your listeners might find interesting and fun to listen to. Um, I strongly recommend, as, as I did, that you check out um, certainly any of the Machado instructional resources, um, or if they're ever in your neck of the woods and you're interested in taking a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu seminar, definitely check them out. And John Will is an amazing, amazing instructor in Australia. You'll find stuff of his written online. He's a great life coach um, and martial arts instructor. And that's where I would that's where I would point people to. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we'll get all that stuff linked up for everybody who's listening. And one final thing, as we head out, we've heard some some wonderful stories from you today. And I I feel like I've got a pretty good idea of, of who you are. So I appreciate that. But what would you leave everyone left with? You know, as you, as you walk off the mat, walk off the stage, what are your final words? Well, first of all, of course, thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to whoever's listening to this, whenever it is you're listening to this. I, I am honored and appreciative that you've 
decided to spend a few of your a good few of your remaining minutes left in your life um, with me and listening to my voice. I I think that's what I would say. I, I feel like um, life is short and it's always a little shorter than we think. Um, and I think that um, especially in these times of conflict in the United States where we're so politically divided, I wish if people could just remember that, you know what, it's all going to end <laughs> and you're not going to have another chance to kiss your loved ones or do anything good in the world. This is your moment. This is the day. This is your chance. And if everyone would just, you know, maybe set, be, be a little less selfless, a little more selfless <laughs> and just say, what can I do to help the world right now? And if that's, you know, helping an animal, fine. If it's volunteering at your church or whatever it is that you believe is the thing that the world needs to be a better place to leave the world a better place than we found it. I wish that people would do that. And I hope that you'll do that. And I, I see that as part of the martial arts. It's a, it's an, it's about honor. It's about, um, you know, defending what we believe in. And I would just ask everyone to, to do that. And like I say, if it's maybe trying to trying to eat a little less meat, that's fine. That would be helpful uh, for a lot of reasons and certainly to some little animal somewhere that maybe doesn't get killed, but really just anything, whatever it is, I feel like we get caught up in our daily lives. And then one day, you know, maybe something happens that wakes us up, maybe a diagnosis or something. Don't wait for that day to wake up, wake up today. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you one thing that I, that I share with people sometimes. If, um, you know, if you just close your eyes and imagine that, you know, you're, you're leaving wherever you're at now, you're driving off to your next thing or hopping onto the train or whatever you do to get to your next activity right now. And something happens, you're hit head on collision if you're in a car or train derails or whatever. And, you know, bam, suddenly everything has changed. Suddenly you're blacked out. Suddenly you're seeing lights, you know, emergency lights, you're in the hospital, you got tubes in your arm, you know, and you're going to die and that's it. And that could happen. Um, and if you can just really feel your feeling, what would you think? What would you wish you had done differently? What would you wish you had said differently to someone today, this morning? Who would you have wanted to repair a relationship with? What would you have wanted to do differently in the world? If you can really imagine what that would feel like, and then just open your eyes up again and say, okay, well, I didn't, that didn't happen. That, that shouldn't have to happen for you to have a life-changing experience is my point. Because if that did happen to you today and then you survived it, you would make some changes in your life. Everyone would. They would reprioritize some things. And I'm saying, why? so why can't we just do that now? Why can't we do that without the life-threatening situation and without the head-on collision? If, if it's possible to make those changes in your life, if you do that, if you had that bad experience, then just make them now without the bad experience and you'll live a happier life and, and you'll be happier when the end does come. So that's my invitation to everybody. I think one of the things I really appreciated about Professor Meyer was his diversity in the way that he looks at life and in martial arts and training. It's clear that this guy has a lot of different stuff going on, different stuff that he's interested in, passionate about. And that's what came through to me first and foremost. Of course, having the opportunity to train with legends as he has is inevitably going to lead to stories. But it also, at least in this case, leads to passion. To be around people who are passionate about the martial arts creates other people who are passionate about martial arts. So, sir, thank you for joining us, and I appreciate you sharing that passion with everyone today. If you want the show notes, you know where to go. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. You can find links, photos, and a lot more. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there. Pop over to Whistlekick.com, make a purchase, support the show. And if making a purchase isn't the best way for you to support the show, there are other ways. You can share this or another episode. You can leave us a review on Google or Facebook or in any podcast app or feed, or you can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. And my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your support. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 